Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Sita Beltran, and you are watching Agenda here on Signal TV. We are still airing from different points of the city uh, as we work from home on this uh, 2nd of April, 2020. Now, for those of you who are going steer crazy, wondering if there's any light at the end of the tunnel, I think there might be light at the end of the tunnel if we just follow statistics. Because comparing from the previous day's report uh, on COVID-19 infections and the likes, uh, the other day, the report of new cases was 538. That's what I read for you yesterday. But today in the Philippine Star, the statistics tells us that there were only 227 new cases. That's basically cutting it in half. Now, unfortunately, uh, there are still... Uh, the other day, it was uh, 10, 10 persons uh, passed away, unfortunately. And still, the sad news is that uh, as of uh, today's report, there were eight casualties. Now, the recoveries are kind of slow as of now. Uh, yesterday's news was seven recoveries, and uh, today they only reported uh, one patient fully recovered. But nonetheless, that's still good news because in this uh, dark times, we need a glimmer of hope. Now, I have to warn our viewers to be more vigilant. Uh, watch what's happening. Uh, be discerning in what, what you're reading on Facebook because uh, there is an escalation of criticism, impatience uh, in, on Facebook where people, some people are actually fueling uh, criticism of the government's efforts regarding this pandemic. Now, please uh, put everything in perspective. Uh, don't just look at the Philippine scenario, look at the global scenario. Even the superpowers are on its knees. Uh, United States is having a nightmare. Even President Donald Trump has warned the Americans to prepare themselves for very painful uh, days, weeks, and months to come. Uh, New York City Governor uh, Cuomo, I, I think it's Andrew Cuomo, if I'm not mistaken, he has uh, appealed. Uh, and New York uh, Mayor uh, Del Basho are calling for help, asking for help, because they're having a nightmare dealing with COVID-19. So put everything in perspective. And uh, as you may have heard, there was already public yesterday because a left-leaning group, the Kadamai, were inciting people to go on EDSA uh, under the guise that there's uh, a group of people giving away relief goods. And it turned out that it was fake news. And what ended up was the arrest of 21 who, uh, people who were arrested for civil disturbance for violating the curfew. So apparently there's a lot of fake news news out there. There's also this fake news going out that uh, government or government troops were raiding hospitals, confiscating medicine or uh, medical supplies. That is purely fabricated. That's fake news. And unfortunately, some politicians, I have to call out some politicians that are now being targeted by the Department of Interior and local government because they are trying to essentially run their own scenario, create their own system to the disadvantage or to the, <clears throat> the uh, problem, you know, to the disadvantage of other uh, cities, other towns, and other provinces. And uh, while the DILG, USEC, uh, Jonathan Malaya won't name them. He has basically said that there are three governors that's uh, going to be charged at a later date for violating uh, or, or disregarding the national government's directions. Now, there are also a number of senators who have been criticized, and, and that is truly unfortunate. Nonetheless, President Duterte has warned groups disrupting quarantine that he will not 
uh, have second thoughts about uh, sending them to jail. In fact, the president uh, said in his night, my orders to the police and the military, including the barangays, if there would be conflict and there is an occasion where that they fight and put your lives in danger, shoot them dead. Now, most of us are used to the president's uh, way of speaking, but under the present circumstance, this is uh, something to seriously consider because the last thing we need is a uh, public the civil disturbance or uh, people just uh, going uh, out of control. The government officials or local government officials failing to use the full force of the law, especially against troublemakers. The IATF, the Interagency Task Force on Emerging uh, Infectious Diseases, has also called out uh, against the discrimination uh, against health workers and said that it won't tolerate uh, such discrimination. Uh, right now, the biggest problem for the, uh, the report that's coming in more often is that we have we have uh, health workers who are being discriminated against by their own landlords, landladies. Uh, they are being prevented from leaving their dorms or being prevented from returning to their barangays. We'll look into all of that in, uh, uh, later, but for in the meantime, the good news and the positive news, because we have been here, uh, contacts, as you know, my, my wife is, a, is an expat or foreigner, and we have uh, been receiving from all the way to the Netherlands, uh, France, etc., and complimenting the Philippine Department of Tourism, because they have apparently been going out of their way to assist foreign tourists helping them get back home. So uh, let's find out from the representative of the DOT. Uh, we have online Undersecretary Benito Bong Bengzon. Yusek Bengzon, magandang umaga po sa inyo. Uh, we hope you are healthy. Uh, you are apparently also working from home. Good morning, Sito. It's uh, good to see you. It's been a while. But uh, thank you for asking. Uh, I'm fine. I'm working from home, uh, but everything is uh, fine. Okay. In this, you know, in this difficult times, uh, I think we have to get all the, we can, we should all take the compliments and the good news that we can find out there. And I will be the first to say that we have been receiving a lot of compliments uh, from French nationals, from Dutch nationals, uh, from foreigners whose family members were trapped in the Philippines. Well, not trapped, but stranded in the Philippines because of the international uh, quarantines. And they have been saying and complimenting the DOT that, that your people on the ground have really gone out of their way, helping them find their law, helping them find transport. Uh, per, in particular case, there was a family uh, who mentioned that their daughter and her boyfriend were stranded in Dumaguete, uh, lost the passport, the passport was retrieved, and then the, they were uh, brought by Banca all the way to Cebu, and in Cebu they were accommodated and finally put on a plane. Can you please give us the story of what's going on on the ground and uh, other stories of what the DOT is doing? Well, uh, the instruction of Secretary Berna Romulo Puyat uh, was very clear from the very start, and that was to help uh, foreign tourists uh, stranded in various parts of the Philippines. So for about uh, two weeks, the Philippine Department of Tourism spearheaded the uh, uh, mounting of uh, what we refer to as uh, sweeper flights uh, across the country. And by our, our, by our estimate, uh, we... Uh, we have totaled uh, more than 14,000. No? Uh, we've assisted more than 14,000 foreign um, uh, tourists, uh, like I said, across the country to get uh, into their international um, embarkation point. So these are tourists who are stranded in Siargao, in Bohol, in Palawan, in Cebu, 
who we were able to manage to help uh, um, connect to Manila for their uh, outbound flight no, to their home country. So that's some, this is something that we've been very busy with. Uh, our uh, people on the ground um, have been very um, uh, proactive and aggressive in making sure that the, uh, the tourists you know, get to fly out uh, at as soon as time possible. I, I noticed uh, you said uh, Bengzon because, you know, in, in many instances in the past, government agencies, departments will will grab every opportunity to, to promote, to brag, to press release the things they've been doing on the ground. But in this case, in, in spite of helping, as you mentioned, 13,000 tourists, uh, helping uh, stranded tourists, etc., I noticed that the DOT opted to go silent. Uh, you guys did not brag about it. It's actually the foreigners who are bragging on you, bra telling the world that you guys have been doing a great job. Well, these comments are very heartwarming, you know, and I guess they also serve to inspire us. But like I said, um, our main concern really is to just get them out. I know the, uh, the anxiety, uh, uh, the uncertainties uh, that uh, our foreign visitors uh, felt when they were stranded uh, in the remote islands in the different provinces. And uh, the marching order was very clear to coordinate with the other appropriate uh, government, government agencies to make sure that they are uh, repatriated uh, to their home countries. And I have to mention that um, we're also very fortunate to have had uh, support of um, the AFP because um, they uh, used some of the C-130s to... Um, to uh, transfer the, or transport the tourists. Uh, we were also able to get support from uh, the Philippine Coast Guard and, of course, uh, the DILG you know, in coordinating with the different local government units. So uh, we're quite happy with the turnout. Um, I think I have to mention that uh, this kind of assistance is something that um, normally the uh, tourism, the national tourism bodies uh, initiate. You know? if, you go, if you look at other countries, I don't think you will see a similar initiative um, by their uh, respective national tourist um, authorities or organizations. So I think that makes the Philippine Department of Tourism unique because we actually, uh, we really went out of our way to uh, assist uh, the stranded foreigners. Okay, what, what was the reaction or assistance of the tour operators and the, uh, the facility owners, uh, the resort owners, hotel owners, what were their involvement in this sweeper activity? Because, I mean, you have to figure out where the tourists are. Where, or was there a network or a call center that you guys employed to find all? I, I hope I'm not correct. You did say 13,000 tourists, right? Yes. Well, close to 14,000 14, 14, uh, foreign tourists. But... The, um, yeah. the, uh, the uh, activities on the ground were being orchestrated by our various regional offices. And the regional offices would make sure that um, the stranded tourists uh, would um, have uh, adequate uh, accommodation. So that, that entailed working with uh, the tour operators and uh, the hotels and the resorts uh, themselves. Uh, it also involved uh, making sure that they're able to... Um, to move no, from the hotel uh, to, to the airport. So that's the kind of um, uh, convergence or um, liaison work that we had with the tour operators, the hotels, and the resorts uh, on the ground. Any idea, Yusek Bengs, on, on how many more are stranded or have undergone voluntary be voluntarily being stranded? in the philippines because uh, i know of a few people who decided forget this i'm going on forced vacation not forced quarantine well i'm, I'm glad that you mentioned it because we do have a number of uh, foreign tourists who opted no to uh, uh stay put uh, in you know wherever they are currently um i know of some europeans who've decided to stay put in um, in palawan there are some who've decided to stay put in Shargao. And in a way, it's a, it's a good sign for us because um, it demonstrates the, um, the trust and confidence no, in our ability to, um, to assist them and our ability to, to control the situation. So the fact that they opted to stay here rather than to fly to their home country, I think sends a very good message. Yeah, yesterday, I interviewed a couple out of Chicago and uh, 
the husband or, or the boyfriend, I'm not, I'm not really sure what that setup was, or, or maybe they were just friends, but I interviewed the couple out of Shargao yesterday, and, and they, I was informed that they've stopped surfing, they've stopped, uh, they've strictly implemented uh, social distancing, etc. Now, uh, it's uh, set up as far as the quarantine and tourist, tourist activities are concerned. Well, we leave it up basically to the LGU. Most uh, local government units have also uh, passed their, their own uh, ordinances with respect to you know, a wide range of uh, measures to contain uh, uh, COVID-19. So some of them have their own versions of uh, enhanced community quarantine. Some of them are also restricting movements um, in their localities. Um, and this is basically the responsibility um, of uh, the different LGUs. I just wanted to mention also, Sito, that apart from uh, the sweeper flights that um, we've, uh, we've mounted uh, for, that, uh, for about two weeks, we've also set up a 24-7 online uh, response team. No? This, is, um, this is a 24-7 team. We work in uh, four shifts, no? six hours a day. And the idea behind it is to make sure that uh, we maintain communications via Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and our own email with um, our with our stakeholders. So when I say stakeholders, I'm not only talking about the foreign tourists who are stranded, but uh, all those who are part of the, the value chain. So 24-7, we get inquiries from the tour operators, from the travel agents, uh, and even, of course, from uh, the travelers themselves. So this is also our way of uh, reaching out to them and to make sure that uh, whatever concerns they have are addressed uh, in the best way possible. Okay, that, that's good to know. Now, I've uh, been in communication with uh, Secretary Bernard Romulo Puyat yesterday, and in fact, it was uh, her suggestion that you go on board today because she is under home quarantine. Now, uh, that's, uh, that's rather unfortunate, but preferred that she rest because uh, that, that poor lady has not had a lot, any much rest since uh, she became secretary. She's been working so hard. Now, uh, for the DOT, uh, f physically, medically, and health-wise, uh, what's our situation for the members of the DOT family? Uh, are there any people uh, at the DOT who's been uh, infected by COVID-19, or are you guys all uh, doing well? I hope. Well, well, we, uh, you know, we're, we're very fortunate that the entire DOT family um, is very healthy. There are no reports of anybody being infected. And, uh, of course, we're keeping our fingers crossed that uh, it stays that way. Um, and, of course, just like um, most other stakeholders uh, in the industry, we're hoping to see uh, the light at the end of the tunnel soon. <laughs> Now, because uh, as uh, most uh, people, uh, as many people have mentioned, it would be transportation and tourism would be, which would be among the hardest hit uh, because of the COVID-19. Having mentioned that, uh, Yusek Bong, because uh, I know you are probably the most senior in terms of residency uh, in the DOT at the moment. Now, I I've been watching a lot of these uh, reports and experts of all uh, international experts say that it's going to take five years to recover from this assuming that uh, we actually have a starting point because uh, right now even the government the government is saying that they might have to extend this uh what's your reading uh i know it's too early to be talking about recovery but uh what is the picture like well, you're correct. Um, we have yet to determine what the starting point is. And uh, maybe uh, uh, an interesting input would be what the United Nations World Tourism Organization um, mentioned yesterday, that uh, at this point, um, we have yet to determine the full impact of COVID-19 on the tourism industry. And because we haven't done so, it's also going to be very difficult to... Um, determine, you know, as you pointed out, what the starting point is. Um, we can only come up with rough estimates uh, at this point uh, insofar as the effect on arrivals and revenue uh, are concerned uh, because um, the, the official reports have not been tallied yet. No? When you talk about uh, tourist arrivals in the Philippines, these are 
these figures are, are based on the arrival departure cards that are collected by the Bureau of Immigration, which are then forwarded to the Department of Tourism uh, for encoding. But because uh, we're all work from home, there is no batching to speak of, there is no encoding to speak of. So we will only get a uh, clearer picture once we're able to encode all those uh, arrival departure cards. But the, even then, um, the instruction of Secretary Puyat is already to prepare uh, the framework for what we will refer to as the tourism response and uh, recovery program. Uh, it's going to be a multifaceted, uh, time-bound uh, blueprint for tourism, which will essentially do two things. One is to spell out all the activities that will be under the response period, uh, most of which we are doing already now. And then the second uh, would be on the recovery phase. And again, the big question is uh, when do we start uh, implementing the marketing and promotions program under the recovery phase. So things are still very fluid, but we just want to make sure that uh, when, uh, when we're given the go signal, you know, hopefully soon enough, then we're ready to implement the, the blueprint. Okay, well, uh, I'll have to leave it at that. Uh, Yusek uh, Bong Bengzon, and you guys will be able to pick up real quick because of all the goodwill and the positive uh, PR that you, your team, uh, uh, Secretary Bernard Romulo Puyat's team, has established with the foreign community. Thank you. Stay strong, stay safe, stay healthy. It's a privilege. Uh, stay well, keep healthy, Sito. Take care. Okay. And uh, now from uh, Yusek Bengson, we now go to Congressman Joey Salcedo. A better picture of what really is going on as far as the uh, social amelioration, uh, uh, whatever law that you, you may call that. Uh, good morning, Con Congressman Joey Salceda. I'm sorry to have to rouse you out of bed. No, 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 no. It's, I had difficulty with the technology. So anyway. Okay, yeah, well, uh, well, yeah, welcome to the club. Uh, I'm also having nightmares adjusting to this uh, system. But in any case, uh, Congressman Joey, you're the smartest guy on town. in town when, when oh. we combine uh, ways and means plus uh, dealing with disaster. Now, here's our problem. We've been hearing so many senators, well, not so so many, a couple of senators and politicians and, and experts uh, berating the government, saying that where's the money, what's happening to them, the law has been signed. Can you please explain to us what exactly is supposed to be the situation? You guys met a week ago, passed a law, gave the president uh, special powers and a special budget. Now everybody's nipping at his heels, saying... Where's the money? Well, we have the money. And essentially, that's $175 billion for, for DOCC. Because we actually, um, that's the, uh, a practice which not everybody knows. The GOCC, po, yung, their budget is actually on a plus one. In other words, whatever they earned this year or whatever they kept last for, is actually supposed to be earmarked for next year. So actually, what we're using right now is what we would have used next year from the GOCCs. So that's about 175 billion pure cash. It's there. The other one is 100 billion that will essentially come from the budget of this year, 2019, on those items that are that have been uh, identified to be slow moving due to uh, right away problems. So we have 275. If the issue is do we have money, we have money. But the other problem is, do we have money for next year? That's not the thing. Okay, now, okay, so there is money. Uh, it's money that hasn't been spent. It's money that has been put away. Now, uh, accord, according to some senators, we signed the law. How come it's not being distributed? I mean, this is one week. Is it really realistic <laughs> based on your many experience in Albay? Parang, Possibly, but some people, some of my friends are saying, do you want that to come with fries as well? Parang, parang fast food. Uh, of course, we have to try, uh, we have to do it faster, but uh, we should have set the expectations quite clearly. Vis-a-vis -vis the demand, because the demand is, uh, we're now into our third week of uh, ECQ, and definitely some people are getting hungry. Some of the savings of the community, because we're not just looking at personal savings, 
due to the extended family or extended clan system of the Philippines, we have uh, some leeway. But uh, by the third week, I'm sure they are depleted. So we need to replenish the community. And uh, in that sense, I think it was very critical that kung kaya mo lang, sana may labas na yung pera ngayon, to, ngayon pong third week. And of course, we will ha- hindi yung ganun kadali. Uh, pero may mga may maray masasabi natin na uh, the, the move of the president yesterday to essentially centralize it, hopefully that will work because uh, we now have just one co- institution called the DSWD and they will definitely start with the 4.4 million. Remember, this is 18 million individuals or 73% of the entire country that will receive some form of a cash. So yung CCT is uh, four pieces, 4.4 million. May mga banko na po yan. May mga bank accounts. In other words, yung tubo nandiyan na, yung gripo nandiyan na, pwede kagad yung lagyan po ng tubig. Yung pangalawa is the UCT. And we have a pretty good uh, database already there. So what we're looking for is the 8 million informal settler, informal workers. Ito mga, uh, mga driver po ng tricycle, ito po mga parlor, ito po mga... Um, so I think uh, right now uh, I am not as uh, bearish in uh, that we will not be able to deliver because I think uh, uh, with military people there essentially now um, doing the entire... Um, the entire um, social amelioration, then I think for them it's just another, you know, another soldier being, uh, in other words, in this sense, the, the soldier is cash. Cash is the soldier, and therefore they should be able to deploy it. Okay, so what would be a reasonable timeline? Uh, ano nga, o mala, ma, asahan ng mga mamamayan? Uh, bago dumating ito, lalo na dun sa mga informal, informal work, uh, workers, uh, how many weeks, uh, days? Uh, I hope next week na yung may mga tinatawag nating system-based uh, beneficiaries. I hope that we can already get that get it out starting uh, ano ba ngayon, Friday. Hopefully, I think we did the day. So dapat Thursday. wala ng bank. Thursday. So hopefully na we will be able to open the gates. Let's say, I think we should keep banks open on Saturday and Sunday for CCT and for the UCT. So, madali-dali lang po yun. And for uh, the formal workers, meron naman po mga tinatawag natin camp or yung COVID, yung employer mismo. Actually, hindi po nakikita na lahat. Hindi masyado po na, ano, because uh, I think uh, ayaw naman mag-agaw po ng social space sa mga corporation. I've never seen in my lifetime you know, na yung buong, uh, I think, uh, the, our uh, big business, this is also the first time that the president really lined up everybody who helped, but uh, there's a lot that's being done already in by at least, you know, a lot of these uh, big business and, you know, you name it, every type and every big conglomerates are well into it, going beyond and sacrificing their, um, essentially, their profitability in helping the country. Uh, really weather this. So, in fact, I think some of them, uh, I think the entire group is uh, adopting the entire Metro Manila because most likely, you Metro Manila po were 85% of all the infections. You just can imagine that the, in Metro Manila, kasi pag tingnan mo po yung mga infections right now, yung mga confirmed cases, uh, yun na may mga residents. Kasi yung iba kasi wala pa nakalagay na residents eh. Uh, individual PH uh, 2,100, something like that. But if you look at those who have residents, 75% of them are Metro Manila and seven, and roughly about uh, uh, mga 9% of them are yung Imos, Bacoor, Marilao, mga things like that. So you can actually see already. So ang kailangan na lang po talaga is a higher level of testing than well, just going back, kasi napalayo ko, ang sinasabi ko lang, na yeah. even the business sector has some sense of where to really concentrate because uh, uh, dito po sa Metro Manila, kailangan po talagang alagaan kasi nga po, mukhang nandito po talaga where we will have to be more stringent in the the next, what we can call an ECQ2 or a, uh, any post-COVID strategy would need, would need to deal really with Metro Manila. Okay, you mentioned you mentioned you mentioned something that really started ECQ two. Are you part of any, yes. any consultative group 
and is this well, an, uh, uh, a real option right now? Ah, uh, sa so tingin ko um hindi na uh, kumaran kasi kung may testing lang kasi kasi alam mo yung gagawin mo pag ganitong pandemic katulad ko sa Albay, simple lang yes. po ginagawa ko may pagtingin ng bagyo. Sino ba pwede patayin ito? So, kailangan, kumbaga, doon sa amin, talagang there, it's a universal enumeration talaga of every individual risk. So, here, the best way, because it's a pandemic, is you really need to have first a spread of all the risks, the vulnerabilities. You can have anybody, everybody above 50, anybody who have pre-existing conditions. So, you can map it. So, in this case, the only way to test this is through testing. So, you need to test. And then you need to isolate and trace. And if we would have done, kasi ngayon nasa 14,000 tests pa lang tayo, if we could have had 200,000 tests between now and 14, I think any post-COVID uh, ECQ, any post or any ECQ2 would be less uh, stringent kasi we could focus on the infection clusters. So, pananaw ko na sa ngayon, without the test, it uh, because you know I am from uh, I, I my my background is really my job is to take risk for as long as I have a grasp of it and uh, I can put up contingency plans for it. So right now, um, parang there is no, there are, uh, there's already a consensus I think in the in the national leadership that we need to do a lot of tests between now and uh, April 14 so you can make a decision. Because, of course, we cannot go on like this forever. But at least, you know, there's already international, uh, what you call, practices where in Talaga, you have to do at least six weeks. Although there are success stories that did not do six weeks, like uh, probably the Bay Area, you have probably Massachusetts, you have probably South Korea, you have probably Taiwan, and uh, probably the, um, Taiwan. So... You can study all. I think that's the, that's what I've been doing right now. Actually, I've given more time really to study comparative um, epidemic manage uh, epidemic management uh, across the world. So you can probably brought the brought, brought bring all the learnings to fore in uh, the current situation of the Philippines. Okay. Well, uh, I'll have to leave it at that, uh, Congressman Joey Salceda. Thank you very much for your inputs, and uh, please stay safe, stay strong, stay healthy. Thank you very much, and uh, uh, thank you very much, Sito. Okay, that was Congressman Joey Salceda, and as uh, he explained, it takes a little while, and uh, we will uh, now go to a U.S.-based scientist, and uh, this gentleman or uh, uh, expert will help us understand, and let's uh, take off from what uh, Congressman Salceda mentioned, because... Uh, uh, some of you would probably be now, you know, wondering what e uh, ECQ2 is going to feel like. Okay, we have uh, Darwin Bandoy. He is a U.S.-based uh, scientist. Uh, Darwin, good morning to you. Good morning, Sir Sito. I hope you are doing well there. Okay, well, uh, same. Li likewise for you. And uh, Darwin, uh, my team... Uh, has uh, referred you to me because apparently you've done models uh, regarding the uh, coronavirus pandemic uh, and uh, you might have ideas to share or knowledge to share for our viewers. Could, could you please uh, give me a perspective on what this uh, study is and uh, this model is and what are we looking at right now? Um, sir, uh, just to give you a general idea, uh, I did some infectious disease modeling uh, using state-of-the-art methods, which is uh, SIR and there's another one, SEIR model. In the Philippines, sir, I know there are at least four groups who did similar. One is from Ateneo, they have the FASTER. Another one is Philippine Institute of Developmental Study, they presented it to DOH. Another one is DOH has their own model. Uh, the difference is the mm -hmm. models are private. I'm sure they have reasons for it because some of the numbers are panic-inducing. But I released my mm -hmm. model for people who need to make decisions, like people in the food industry because I'm a veterinarian. My appointment in UP Banyos is an assistant professor at vet school. So I think some people need to grasp it. 
Um, just a general perspective of the model, we are not yet on the peak. So meaning that we are still expecting more cases based on because we haven't reached the peak of the epidemic. But it appears that based on proper, uh, various modeling scenarios, using suppression strategies, this ECQ, school stoppage, and all of these measures can bring down the number of cases. There's a problem mm -hmm. with that scenario because the moment we remove the ECQ, the cases will shoot up again. So the general recommendation is we use the ECQ to buy us time for two things. One, similar to what Sir Joey was saying, we increase our testing capacity so that we will just isolate the people that will test positive in their household, supply them more food, and quarantine them. As of today, I don't feel that we have that capacity. So we don't need to lock down entire city. We will just lock down specific individuals that would test positive if we can do mass testing. But another end okay, that... vaccine, still several months. It's, it will take so long. Yeah, uh, yes, that's actually the game plan of uh, Secretary Lito Galvez, uh, who has said that they're going to, they're already studying forced quarantine, uh, where they will identify who the PUIs are and the PUMs are, and then relocate them to hotels, hostels, or other medical facilities so that they no longer uh, become a risk uh, to the general population or to their own families. So parang, parang ang mangyayari nito, magpapakabayani ka na. If you are a PUI or you are a PUM, you're going to have to bite the bullet. You're going to have to step up and, and make the sacrifice of going under isolation so that you limit the possible contact and expansion of, of the disease. Now, okay, so, or of the virus. So now we're okay on that. We are in agreement, uh, the vaccine, that's 18 months uh, away. And we, we're also in the bottom end of the chain. So before we even get that vaccine, the rest of the world, developed world will probably get it. So, okay, uh, let, m moving forward, what, is the scenario going to look like? Because you're in agreement or you support the position of a uh, ECQ2, Extended Community Quarantine 2. Uh, business people are already saying they also support uh, not the same version, but a gradual return to normal, which is actually, you know, just, just a nice way of saying it because... Uh, we still have to do make it longer now. How much longer do you think will we have to put this uh, extended community quarantine? Sir, this is a contextual answer. So let me qualify the answer. Okay. How many ventilators do we have in the Philippines? According to a survey to pulmonolo uh, pulmonologists, we have 1,500 estimated ventilators. 500 of that is available in Manila. Yeah, so we have 1,500 available. Yes, in the Philippines, according to a survey. So if our number of severe cases exceeded that, we will be like Italy. We will be rationing who will die and who will survive. Because you cannot survive if you, do, you don't have ventilators. So for me, sir, uh, ECQ is not more of the time frame, but the capacity of healthcare to absorb severe cases. So up to when, up to when we are ready to absorb the severe cases as measured by hospital beds, as measured by ventilator capacity. That's my answer for that. Okay, but uh, as far as uh, going back to normal, or, or I mean, I go back to your first point earlier. You said we haven't reached the. Uh, when does your study actually forecast? When is the probable week, date, month? when we will most likely hit the peak and what will it look like in terms of number of case positive and number of deaths? Sir, for that, if a uh, uh, hypothetical scenario, we remove all restrictions. Within two to three months is the estimate from, from the day we remove all restrictions, we will get to the peak. Uh, my numbers are quite big. It's Num total number of cases is 250,000, but 
half or 80% of that would be asymptomatic. Uh, those with, sh with shows clinical signs would be 10 to 20% of that figure. Severe uh, will require ICU and hospitalization will be 1 to 3% of that number of the 150,000. That is the estimate of uh, cases per day at the peak. You know, yung peak estimate. Ko. So 1 to 3% okay. of the 250,000 is the figure I'm looking uh, DOH has a higher estimate of hospitalization. I think they are fourth is estimating 70,000 at the peak hospitalization. So my figure is be in between the DOH figure that I saw and much higher than the one from Joma Rabahante of UPLB. So yun po yung range. So it's good idea that we have ranges of estimate. Oh, okay, but uh, based on those ranges of estimate, uh, what is the scenario in terms of deaths? Uh, because sir, no one is talking about the forecast of how many people are going to die. Uh, they were and in England, in the UK, they're already saying that if only 200,000 die, we're lucky. But what about in the Philippines? Sir, I extrapolated the estimate. But the problem is U.S. has more absorptive capacity in terms of ventilator. Donald Trump, I think, already ordered one company invoking warlike uh, provisions. Uh, there's a law in U.S. that he can... Uh, say, produce this type of equipment, and they are producing it now. I think I, I read the news. So our problem is we only have 1,500 ventilators. So anything exceeding beyond that, it will. So the mortality rate would be higher than the estimated values. And I think um, Ferguson made the forecast for U.S., which is, I think, 1.5 million and people say that's a large amount. That's crazy. But next, the next two weeks, the U.S. will reach an estimated 100,000 mortality. So the Ferguson estimate is not that crazy anymore. So lower okay, than uh, that because... Yes, sir. Yeah, my, my, my final question. Uh, what, what would... I suppose uh, what is good, the next two weeks going to look like? Um... Since we impose strong suppression strategy, we expect fewer cases um, subject to the testing capacity. So we, but, but take note of this. If we remove, if we can become overconfident of removing all ECQ uh, par, uh, regulations that we're implementing right now, it will rebound. So two possibilities. We maintain a modified version of restriction, more testing, but if we remove the simulation in the models will show that if we totally remove everything, cases will rebound again. So those those are the scenarios that I'm looking based on the model. Well, thank you, Doc. And uh, please uh, stay strong, stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you very much, uh, Darwin, for all of your input. You're welcome, sir. Okay, that's uh, Darwin Bandoy. And uh, he actually, uh, there, there are a lot of people who are, doing uh, this sort of uh, study analytics forecasting from statisticians doctors uh, vet even veterinarians etc because it's not a it's not about what your professional practice is it's about the numbers it's a I hate to say it, the numbers we are going to find out definitely and uh, it seems from uh, the way things are going from yesterday's interviews today in are not finished with the expanded community quarantine and that's all right because we we don't want to waste money waste have to come back as uh, Darwin Bandoy said we don't want a relapse we'll go we'll go into a break and when we come back more interviews uh, here on agenda
online, I think it's an online uh, system, for those of you who are worried that you might have COVID-19, you might have a cough, you might have a sore throat or diarrhea in your... F and uh, our next guest, Dr. Carl... Uh, uh, Carl Abola, I think. Uh, I hope I didn't say that wrong. Car Carl Abola and uh, Dr. Carl uh, Lola. Uh, okay, Carl, are you there? Okay, we're having a problem with Dr. Carl's microphone. Uh, Doc, could you just check if your microphone is uh, muted? Uh, having that problem nowadays. Uh, just uh, just do a countdown. Okay, we are going to have to go back uh, there, there, Dr. Carl. Okay, there's uh, a lot of people who are freaking out, and, and now would be a good time to memorize your doctor or your physician's phone numbers, but uh, text them first because uh, I have a lot of uh, friends, uh, physician friends, who are swamped with phone calls from friends, relatives, neighbors, who are also paranoid about the, the COVID-19. So far, from what we've uh, encountered or what we've picked up on in our interviews, a lot of uh, people are sharing the basic information. Uh, often it starts with a sore throat, a dry cough, and then what follows are it's a fever, uh, actually no, body aches, sore throat, dry cough, fever, and diarrhea. Because in the beginning of all of this uh, COVID-19 thing, people were saying, oh, you don't get uh, diarrhea, you don't, you don't have a runny nose. But apparently the symptoms are very much flu-like. Cost us a lot of problem. Anyway, let's go go back to Dr. Carl Ablola. Uh, Dr. Carl, are you there? Uh, is your microphone working? Dr. Carl, we can't seem to pull him out. Uh, in any case, we Dr. Carl, are you there? Okay. Well, uh, I'll carry on. So. You know, uh, when, when this COVID-19 started, uh, people were uh, saying it's flu-like symptoms. And that was what got us. We all assumed it was just like the flu. Uh, even, I think, uh, a couple of presidents and prime ministers, oh, they dismissed it. Oh, it's just a flu. Don't worry about it. But as it turns out, uh, it's more than a flu. Killer. It's a killer virus. And the first targets, understandably, are people uh, who are 60 and above with uh, virus comorbidities. Uh, in the United States, they're saying that the top uh, problem would be those with diabetes, 60 years old, di diabetic. And then if you have a lung problem, then you've got to, you, you better stay home because if you don't, chances are it's going to get you. In any case, uh, Carl Ablola, are you back there? Uh, no, I don't think there. Okay, <clears throat> Dr. Carl, uh, I hope you're working now. I don't think we, we are going to be able to pull him out just yet, but uh, I, I am communicating with our crew and we will find out, Dr. Carl, uh, if we can get you back in. In any case, uh, so back to what I was saying, the flu-like symptoms is what got most of us. It's a killer virus. Now, uh, what are some good news I can share, pick up with many of you? Uh, personally, here in our barangay, I live in Barrio Capitolio in Pasig, we actually received our first bag of groceries from the barangay. Now, you might say, hey, come on, Cito, you're not an indigent. Well, I think just about every barangay has the money. And be, it's not about rich or poor, ladies and gentlemen. There are many people caught unawares or didn't know, especially uh, elderly senior citizens living on their own or couples living by themselves 
who didn't know about this. They're not into rain their own business. And then, wow, they're not allowed to go out. They, they can't go shopping. They can't go to the bank, etc. So let's not be judgmental. Let's not make presumptions that, you know, only the poor should get the grocery. We got our grocery bag. I think there were like two kilos of rice and some uh, cans of sardines. And we passed them on. We gave them to our uh, construction workers in the neighborhood. Uh, some people gave their grocery bags to security guards, tanods, to their drivers to take home to their families. So it, that's the good news, that the barangays are aiming to move. And for those pe people who are seeing in the news, you know, the depressed the areas, they're not getting the, the relief goods, etc. Please, as I mentioned at the start of the program, put everything in perspective. If you are taking care of so many uh, informal settlements in your barangay, like that one, in Canada, where there are not just hundreds, but thousands of individuals and hundreds of families, what are the chances that it's going to take a while. I think that here in the Philippines, you know, the sad part, even some so-called leaders, senators, congressmen, governors, have come up with this, have developed a fast food mentality. You can't bake a cake in 30 minutes. You can boil rice maybe in five, 10 minutes. I think you can't even boil water under three minutes, if I'm not mistaken. So, I mean, it takes hours to cook. It takes hours to pack. It takes hours to deliver, days to put all of this together. Let's put everything in perspective. And and if you were, may I, may I encourage you to, to just step up, correct these people, not attack them, not criticize them. You know, these this people who are just basically belly aching, and point out to them, give them perspective, and just counsel them that, hey, guys, we are in this together. And it doesn't help if we start bitching instead of praying. And instead of helping, all you can do is criticize. In any case, uh, we are going to try again to get get uh, Carl. Uh, Dr. Carl, are you there? Verbal try. Dr. Carl, now? are we... There, okay, we're trying, we're trying. There you go, Dr. Okay. Carl. Okay, Hello. thank you. Finally, I was worried I wasn't going to get you, but can you give our viewers, okay, can you give our viewers an idea? What exactly is this Bayanihan MD? Ano itong ginagawa ninyo, Dr. Carl? Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Mr. Beltran. Bayanihan MD is a non stop non profit. Uh, non-government organization. We started back in 2013 uh, with a group of friends of no, uh, all doctors. No? Uh, and then um, we all we we, uh, we are involved in many social uh, social civic activities like medical missions wherever we are needed. But right now, because of the current burden in our healthcare system, we decided as a group no, to start e consultation as well over the internet. So hope, daily we see patients uh, around 200 patients a day and 20 to 30 doctors are answering you know, mostly specialists from different fields of uh, specialization in medicine. How, how does the system work? Because just the other day, I did an online consultation with, with our, uh, she's our, our derma, uh, Kelly Sarte, and I took a photo of the rash I had Mm -hmm. And I sent it to her, and she said, I don't know if I should say it, Sito, you have a form of the hives. So uh -huh. I, I got uh, I got the antihistamine, and I feel better. Now, how do you guys do it? So basically, we use, you know, uh, although it's really, really limited compared to seeing an actual patient, we use the technology that we have now. Uh, if we need, we need pictures, or we need to call the patient, or... If we need to do a video conference to actually see the patient, uh, we do that. We use the current tools uh, on the internet uh, using the okay, so, uh, platform. Okay, now, how, 
what is the range of, for consultation? Because, I mean, clearly you can't uh, figure out all medical conditions, but what is the range and what sort of doctors are on board for this online consultation? So we see a lot of patients, different uh, problems no? from COVID-related, COVID non-COVID-related, a lot of dermatologic cases, pediatric cases. Mostly and uh, we can manage outside the hospital. We cater to those uh, patients. However, when we encounter urgent or emergent cases needing to be uh, needing to be seen in the clinical setting or in the hospital setting, we refer them accordingly. Uh, our specialists ranges from um, general practitioners, internists, uh, surgeons, dermatologists, pediatricians. We even have radio radiation oncologists, uh, radiologists, legal medicine. We have all the experts uh, in the field helping us, volunteering out of goodwill. Okay, right now, how many patients or what's the scorecard as far as consultations go? How many patients have gone online for, for consultation? So we operate no, from 9 to 12 and 1 to 3, Monday to Saturday online. Um, we see on an average daily 200 patients, but uh, steady, steadily, it's increasing on a daily basis. And a good thing is that there's a lot of volunteer, volunteer doctors as well daily. So right now we can catch up with the increasing number of patients. Hopefully uh, more and more doctors will volunteer so that we can answer all of the questions of the patients. Okay, uh, I, I'm not being nasty, Dr. Carl, but mm -hmm. you know, the reality is uh, many patients criticize doctors for being late for clinic <laughs> hours. Uh, I'm guilty you know, of that as well. Uh, is, it, is it happening online? Uh, no, no. Um, uh, uh, no, uh, but there's one time that we started late, but it never happened again. Uh, basically, there's 20 of us at the same time, 20 to 30 doctors, so medyo mababa yung chance na nangyayari yung ganong eventuality. So there's someone daily who's assigned to be the triage officer. So he opens or she opens the system and she manages, she decks the patients. If ever this patient needs a dermatologist, a pediatrician, so we avoid those unnecessary delays. Okay. Now, uh, how do you see this changing the business model? Because uh, <laughs> uh, I, for one, coming going via internet, doing this uh, show, it shows that I can actually do this in the farm. I can do this wherever I travel. Um, mm -hmm. Physicians, uh, what has this revealed to you in terms of the practice of medicine and in terms of commerce? Okay, so for, for, uh, for, for us physicians, the first uh, message is that, um, of course, you still need to see the patients. That's the best, no? You see the actual patient, you do your physical exam, history, complete history, and the completeness of the advices or the therapeutic and non-therapeutic advices that you're going to give. Iba pa rin, syempre, nakikita mo. But because of this, okay. though, we are actually seeing the importance of e-medicine uh, e e or telepo telemedicine. Uh, we were, were able to reach you know, geographically isolated areas uh, na hindi walang mm. access to healthcare. Uh, they don't need mile, uh, to go to the health center. Na, no? uh, they, they just need to call uh, us, no? uh, physicians. Uh, we are limiting the barriers of transportation, the tra barriers of uh, uh, go, the ability of the patient to go to other facilities. However, it will never again replace an actual uh, visit to a doctor. But it, uh, it decreases the burden of our health system. Okay, well, I'll have to leave it at that, Dr. Carl, mm -hmm. and uh, I pray that uh, you and your associates continue with this noble mm -hmm. service to the population. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you, you and stay God. strong. Mm -hmm. Stay okay, healthy. Stay, stay strong, care. stay healthy. Okay, stay safe. Thank you, Mr. Thank you very much, Dr. Mm -hmm. Carl Ablola. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's it for me for today. I've gone over time, and uh, we just want to thank all our viewers uh, to our viewers in uh, Coron Palawan, particularly our friends at Poco Deli uh, who are, are watching the program, and to all over the Philippines watching Agenda. Please uh, keep in
get in touch with us if there are topics or issues or stories that you want to share with us. And we pray that all of you would continue to stay safe, stay strong, stay healthy, and allow me to close. Uh, if you have time, go to the book of Numbers, uh, chapter 6, verse 24, I think it is. And uh, may God bless all of you. Have a great day. Uh, it's uh, chapter 6, 24 to 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And with that, I say goodbye. Have a great day.